it's time to let your sports opinions fly for the main event. A seven-team elimination match to decide the District 4 3A Championship. Presented to you live by PilotPointBearcats.com. This 10-week match has been sanctioned by the University of Interscholastic League. Our celebrity referee for the District 4 3A show is none other than the daytime psychology professor, Texas high school football storyteller, North Texas insider, and DFW Inside High School Sports, the most feared member of the Texas High School Mafia, the one, the only, small town Dixie, the professor, Hello, friends. It is time for another District 4-3A report. This is Episode 3 of Season 3. I am the Professor Matt Diggs. Thank you for tuning in for another action-packed episode. And this week, we are finally starting to get some data. We're starting to get some idea of what the 2023 season is going to look like. And I think the overall theme that I can see so far is a golf. And what I mean by golf is I think there is such a big drop-off from one, two, and three, and probably some uh, differentiation in positions one, two, and three, and four, five, six, and seven. Four, five, six, and seven are incredibly close together, but unfortunately they just don't have the Jimmys and Joes to compete with level one, two, and three, which would be uh, Brock, Paradise, and Whitesboro. And I'm seeing that golf expand. I think we're going to see some pretty gnarly scores when it comes to this uh, district as far as that top three against the bottom four. I'm just not seeing anything that uh, from last week that would indicate anything otherwise. I was a little bit excited about Boyd, uh, but as we're talking about, Boyd had a disappointing performance to Blue Ridge. Obviously, a lot of turnovers. I believe they had five turnovers in that game. Uh, facilitated that beating from Blue Ridge, so maybe Boyd will show us a little bit more. I got a chance to see Peaster in person. They they impressed me at times. They obviously were very competitive. Probably had the best non-district game as far as in that bottom four as far as competition goes. Uh, but they ended up falling by the wayside. The toller, my, my rattlers at the uh, Snake Farm, and we're going to talk about it all. But we will start at the top of District 4-3A, and we will talk about uh, those Brock Eagles. And man, what can you say about Brock other than they just must be snake bitten? I mean, what is happening there is just, you, know, you look at it, and, and I was so excited about this team. I'm still excited about this team. I'm not changing my viewpoint on that based on one game, because uh, Texarkana Pleasant Grove is an incredibly good team. I mean, Texarkana Pleasant Grove is the kind of team that is going to be uh, competitive for, you know, a, a state championship. You know, if, if they can be competitive in that District 7, Gilmer was a little bit down this past week. Uh, they're 0-1. Carthage struggled a little bit against uh, Kilgore in that game. So you can look at, and then you look at the rest of the district, uh, obviously you have Sunnyvale and Aubrey on the DFW side in uh, 4A Division II, but you don't look at anybody in, uh, in this region at least and go, well, that's you know, obviously Carthage. To be the man, you got to beat the man. And until somebody can beat Carthage, they will maintain that presence in 4A uh, Division II. But Pleasant Grove is really good. So I, I think that's important to note. But how they lost, I mean, it is just absolutely incredible. Brock Brock's defense held so strong all game. And from what I understand, uh, the quarterback was trying, he had a first down to end the game uh, and was just trying to uh, reach out the ball to make sure he got the first down, you know, depending on what the video and what you see, maybe he thought he didn't have the first down, maybe he did, was just trying to make an extra effort, 
got the ball uh, stripped from him. And then uh, a few plays later, uh, Akari Johnson hit Jackson Gibson for the 32-yard touchdown with 56 seconds left in the game to end, uh, to give Pleasant Grove its first touchdown. Brock had shut out Pleasant Grove for 47 minutes, just an absolutely dominant performance. And one mistake uh, completely flipped that game over. And again, we talked about with Brock last year, it is the turnovers that continue to plague them and this week, they had three very painful turnovers. But still, even with that, you can see the growth. Because last year, they lost by three touchdowns. This year, they lost by three in a heartbreaking way. Uh, and now they're going to move on to Wichita Falls Hershey. And I think Wichita Falls Hershey will be a favorite in that game. I think when you look at, uh, they played Clint last week and Clint uh, they beat Clint 34 nothing, and Clint is a very bad team in, in that Region 1. Uh, Clint just out, they did not even complete a pass. Uh, they were able to run the ball a little bit, but you know they had about 10 different runners, uh, and, and none of them did average more than about four yards a carry. Uh, so I think Brock and, and Hershey had so much talent over the last couple of years, and they still have a couple of players you definitely have to keep an eye on. Uh, but a lot of their, the majority of their big dogs uh, graduated last year. Uh, so when I look at this matchup, I think Brock has a chance to win. But, you know, I, I talk about this with Lovejoy as well. Lovejoy is a 5A uh, Division II team that can score a lot of points. And when they look good, they look really good. But when they play that physical team, that physical style of football, uh, South Oak Cliff has been their Achilles heel, they just they just fold. And I think about Franklin and how when Franklin uh, matched up with Brock, Brock was trying to get tough and, and trying to, you know, and they, they, they improved from the two years ago to last year. And this year, I even see that improvement. And when we're looking at this against a 4A Division one, uh, 4A Division two team, and you know they're going to be continuing to be punching up in classifications this week, uh, because Wichita Falls Hershey is a Region 1 4A Division two team, uh, they are clearly playing physical teams. So I, I like that, and I like that scheduling mechanism. I think this physical team, though, uh, ha has a little bit more weaknesses at places, and I think Brock has a really good chance to win this game. If there is a differentiation between Hershey, if Hershey's a little bit more down than I think, you're going to see Brock just completely explode on them. You know, that, that's what I kind of mean by Brock can... When Brock is better than a team, they are going to put, put a whooping on them. You know, it's going to be 70 0 real quick. I'm not predicting they're going to beat Hershey 70 0, 70 nothing. But like you could see with Springtown, you know, when they are better, just their offensive setup and, and their size, they are going to get out big on a team. But when it is trench warfare, it is going to be some ugly football. And they're exposing their players to some of this ugly football right now. Uh, you know, Brody Woods only went 7 of 18 for. Uh, for 64 yards with two interceptions. Uh, he ran the ball quite a bit, uh, 21 carries for 62 yards. Uh, Brett Tutter carried, had 19 carries for 86 yards. Uh, so Brody Woods kind of took over that uh, Tyler Moody position where you run a lot, you pass, it, you know, little short passes, uh, Gigliota. Um, J Somebody told me it's like a gigolo. So Gigliota, Gigliota, I don't know, Gigolo, Gigolo, no, no, Gigolo. So Gigliota. Uh, one of which he only threw the ball one time, but uh, had a 21-yard completion. So Brock, I think, is still very well positioned in 3A uh, Region One or 3A Division One to be a very, very good team. And I, and again, I'm gonna keep predicting them. I don't know if I'm gonna predict them against Wimberley. Uh, and I'm gonna, I'm, I'm going on a District 4 3A road trip this week. I'm going to go see Gunter uh, play a, a brand new school from Prosper, Walnut Grove, a little bit early. It's a Thursday game, uh, and, and this Walnut Grove team beat a 4A state champion in um, in Arkansas this past week. So I'm highly fascinated by that. Because I think Gunter is on upset watch with this. Uh, you know, they, they, they're they basically taking on a 5A Division One school, at least with size and talent. They've got Prosper's quarterback from last year. Prosper was a 6A regional finalist. Uh, not the quarterback who started, but the quarterback who was expected to take over ended up getting uh transitioned into Walnut Grove. So it's going to be a fascinating matchup. So I'm going to go check that out for, for Brock 
Uh, that's the only time they punch down. I think Brock is going to be a, a decent favorite against Gunter. So I'm going to go check that out with my own eyes. Uh, but I do think Brock will beat uh, Wichita Falls Hershey. I think because Hershey is going to have that size still. And it's going to be one of those, you know, trench warfare games again. Very much like this Pleasant Grove game was. I think uh, I think we're going to see maybe a 21-14 to 14 kind of a game where Brock will go ahead and finally take that win and get one of those wins over the 4A Division II teams uh, because if they don't get it, I don't know if they're going to get it next week against Wimberley, but uh, we'll break down Wimberley and Brock next week as we uh, get to learn a little bit more about Wimberley. Moving uh, down to the next game, we have uh, Cypress Christian against Paradise, and Cypress Christian, you know, just like we talked about, they made it to the state championship game last year in TAPS. Uh, they lost to uh, they lost to Dallas Christian, uh, so we were wondering, okay, we're going to have this private school team against Paradise, uh, and we don't. Really, it's really hard to calibrate those things. A lot of the computer polls, uh, based on the, the strength of schedule from last year, had Cypress Christian as a favorite. I gave you my breakdown on that. The Digsy breakdown won again. And Paradise, for me, they did it with the passing game, uh, and that was a little bit surprising against uh, Cypress Christian. Uh, I don't know. At this point, I don't know what their identity is. Uh, and and I'm, to me, they're a rushing team that can, can throw and, and kind of a, a multi-purpose kind of a, a team. Uh, but, you know, they were pretty much shut down on the running game. And that's something that I'm a little bit concerned about in Paradise. I, I mean, you can look at it on one hand and say 28 rushes for 108 yards. It's not really completely shut down. But Paradise, for me, has put up 300 yards uh, in the past. Uh, but it was Austin Iglesias through the air, 11 of 22 for 283 yards. But he also had two interceptions. So, obviously, uh, that's an issue there. They had a fumble. Uh, they, they did recover the fumble but uh, they, they showed a little bit of sloppiness in this very first game uh, but even with that they, they got the win and uh, Austin Iglesias had a great game uh, he was their leading rusher 14 uh, carries for 35 yards uh, but Cypress Christian was had uh, their their leading running back uh, had 23 carries for 201 yards so Paradise can ha be run on so that's a little bit of a concerning thing as well, but it was a bend, but don't break defense. Uh, we talked about Austin Iglesias and uh, Holly, the uh, star wide receiver that would be Landon Holly, uh, just had an amazing game against uh, Cypress Christian. Uh, he had five receptions for 179 yards and a couple of touchdowns. Uh, so looking at that, you had Landon Holly hit with a 49-yard uh, touchdown catch, a 22-yard touchdown catch. Uh, Aiden Winters had a 28-yard touchdown catch. And then Isaiah Jennings had a one-yard run. Uh, the kick was blocked, and that was the 27. Uh, they ended up winning 27-10. to 10. Uh, They are going to be taking on Munster this week, and Munster played Bells uh, this past week. So now we're getting a little bit of cross-calibration here because – uh, it, it's like we're going to have Paradise and, and Whitesboro taking on Bells and Munster. Munster, Munster. Uh, I know those German folks have their own way of saying things. Uh, and we have Bells for, versus Munster last week, so we have a little bit of uh, calibration as far as seeing that, you know, We'll get a little bit more information, I think, with the two games this week, given that they had a common opponent already, and they can kind of like cross, you know, cross check each other. Bells and Whitesboro are very, very similar. We'll talk about that a little bit more, uh, but I think Par I, I think Paradise is a huge favorite uh, over Munster. This is going to be kind of like we talked about with Brock when you're better than a team. Uh, you know, it's just going to be about how the coach manages the blowout. Uh, will he? Pull in, uh, pull in starters in the second half, uh, and be very, you know, liberal with the rotations uh, very early once they get out on them. Or are they going to go pedal to the metal for three quarters, no matter what, because they need to get the work in. So, you know, we'll find a little. I, I think we're going to find out a little bit about the uh, blowout mentality uh, this week, because I think uh, Paradise is probably could name their score against Munster. Uh, I would, I'll pick a. 50 to 
fourteen kind of a game where you know it might be fifty nothing at halftime, and then the second half goes on uh, the way it does. Obviously, uh, they're able. Austin Iglesias is able to hit deep balls. Uh, you get Landon Holly able to get behind the secondary very easily, and they are able to score uh, pretty much at will. Uh, moving on to uh, Whitesboro, the, the top half of the Gulf, uh, they were able to beat Crum this past week, 49-28. to And, you know, we, we saw what everybody was saying with Clay Hermes, uh, his ability to create plays uh, with his arm and with his legs. Very much, when you, look like, when you look at these stats from this year versus last year, it very much looks like Matt Harper. Uh, 18 of 26 for 206 yards and two touchdowns. He ran the ball 12 times for 47 yards and a touchdown. Uh, Max Parker, Max Parker didn't have that incredible running game, and you know we talked about the offensive line being something we're a little bit concerned about with Whitesboro, and obviously Crum's defense obviously had a lot to do with that. Uh, but 12 carries for 92 yards and three touchdowns, obviously able to get those tough yards in in the red zone. Uh, but, you know, one thing I want to see from Whitesboro is can they get the big runs? Can they get the 30, 40-yard touchdown runs? Does Max Parker have that kind of breakaway speed where, uh, you know, he, he's a threat to go to the house at any point on the field? Uh, or is he just somebody who who's reliable for 8 to 10 yards when – uh, the the offense is able to open up holes, but he's able to get uh, caught by that second level. So that's what, what we're going to be keeping an eye on with uh, Max Parker. Uh, obviously, very talented uh, running back. A lot of people have good things to say, but to put up 49 points uh, against another 4A uh, school is, to me, impressive. That's what I wanted to see. The defense a little bit questionable, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, they they, they got it done. They they won the game. Uh, and they won the game convincingly in that 49 to 28 battle. Was I was curious, could Whitesboro even put up 49 points? And the answer is yes, they were able to do that. Uh, on the receiving side, Carter Sluter obviously seems to have good chemistry uh, with Clay Hermes. Uh, five receptions for 83 yards and two touchdowns. Brett Donaldson, seven receptions for 53 yards as well. And this is kind of getting into the Whitesboro thing. Are, are they starting to create a program? that no matter who you put in, they're going to have success because we were worried about how they were going to graduate this year. And I look at pretty much all of the playmakers who were uh, making plays this year, Clay, uh, Carter Sluter, Brett Donaldson, a big part of their offense, they're all seniors. So, you know, what's that next generation going to be looking like? Uh, and and that, that's relevant because I, I think Bells is having the same kind of rebuilding issue. And when you look at what Bells did, uh, you know, they have a sophomore at quarterback. They have uh, multiple juniors running the ball. They have one senior who uh, did it, rush for over 100 yards against Munster. Uh, th- Hayden Allen went 13 for 119 yards and a touchdown. Uh, Easton Helgren, 10 carries for 161 yards and three touchdowns. Uh, and, and so they... They, they're reloading as well, but yet they have a couple of young players who are, who are stepping up and filling in those roles. Uh, but I think at this point, I really like uh, Whitesboro over Bells just because I think that Whitesboro should be able to slow down the Bells running attack in such a way. Uh, and obviously, Munster got their share of yards against Bells and were able to keep that very competitive. I think Whitesboro... Whitesboro and Bells have played very close games since I've been following them. The District 4-3A report has been keeping an eye on on Bells and Whitesboro, and that's been a game that's been a one-score game. I think maybe Whitesboro even expands it to two scores this year. I think Whitesboro wins a 31-21 kind of a game, maybe 31-28 with a late score. Uh, But I think Whitesboro should take care of business against Bells and move to 2-0. The game I'm worried about with Whitesboro is going to be that Pottsboro game. But Pottsboro, uh, they play Callisburg this week, so we'll kind of get a little cross-calibration again uh, because Callisburg had their way with Pilot Point and pretty much a dominant performance. Uh, But Pottsboro did not impress me against Van Alstine. Now, Van Alstine, again, they're punching up into a 4A Division II uh, team, but that's the kind of a game that Pottsboro needs to win and win convincingly if they're going to be a legitimate regional Region II title contender uh, able to get out of that region with Winsboro and Jefferson and Grandview and West and Malakoff and some of those teams. And I thought that they might be coming into the season. So 
a little skeptical on Pottsboro right now, but again, you know, we don't know how good Van Alstine is, so maybe that win ends up being much better uh, as we get to know more about Van Alstine and get to know a little bit more about Pottsboro. So Pottsboro can just completely obliterate Kalisburg. I think it'll show us that golf that I'm talking about with uh, Pilot Point and Brock, or Pilot Point and Peaster, Boyd and Ponder uh, as it relates to the other three. So I think uh, we're going to see all three of the big uh, dogs win this past week, uh, win this upcom upcoming week. But from there, it gets a little bit dicey as far as that goes. We talked about Pilot Point. Uh, they lost to Kalisburg 55-24 to in a game that was not even really that close. Uh, it was 17 nothing in the first quarter. Uh, Pilot Point threw a pick six, and it was 23-3 to before you knew it. The very first score that Pilot Point was able to get was on a trick play. Uh, in the third quarter, it was 41-10 to at one point, and we finally got to see, we talked about Rowdy Robinson, uh, the basketball player uh, made an incredible catch to get on the get on the scoreboard. 41-17. Uh, Crew Chandler th uh, caught another touchdown for Pilot Point, but ended up being 55-24. And Callisburg, from the highlights I watched, was just completely dominant on both sides of the ball. Uh, secondary and uh, defense for Pilot Point was very, very uh, little how they would match up against Paradise Whitesboro and Brock is probably not even as good as they matched up against Kalisburg. So, you know, that, that those scores could get a little bit ugly as, as that continues. Uh, but again, maybe that, maybe we've got some injuries, maybe we'll find some depth, uh, but Kalisburg beating them in that way uh, worries me a little bit, to be quite honest. I think, uh, uh, they are, they're going to play Plainview this week uh, the, in Plainview, not the Texas version of Plainview, but the Ardmore version of Plainview. It'll be Plainview's first game of the year. And just looking back at last year, Plainview won this game 27 nothing. I think Pilot Point was much better than they were this year. So I expect another kind of a blowout again. Uh, and again, I know nothing about Plainview, and they haven't even played yet. So we're just completely guessing. Uh, I, obviously, I'm not in Oklahoma sort of guy, but based on how they did last year, based on how Pilot Point has fallen this year, I think it's pretty safe to say that Plainview probably wins this game uh, by four or five scores. Uh, Boy took on uh, Blue Ridge, and again, the, and this is Boyd punching down at this point, Blue Ridge being a 3A Division II squad, and Blue Ridge pretty much just had their way with Boyd. Uh, this was a game that was actually 14-14 at one point, uh, but Boyd just got consumed by turnovers and they could not stop uh, Blue Ridge at all. Uh, Braden McIntyre obviously had a, had a good yardage game, 19 of 42 for 310 yards. Uh, so that's obviously an eye-popping number, but the eye, other eye-popping number, unfortunately, is four interceptions. And some of the interceptions I saw just were not good. I was able to watch the highlights of that game. And a couple other ones just looked like the receivers were, you know, they were not on the same page yet. Uh, in the rushing game, and I think this is what differentiates Boyd from last year and Boyd from this year, they don't have that running back. And I, and I told you that last week, that was the thing I really wanted to see was who's going to come in and establish themselves. At running back, Luke Brown was the most proficient runner. Uh, he had 15 carries for 33 yards and a touchdown, but that lets you know how ugly the rushing game was. And part of that could be Blue Ridge's defense, but Blue Ridge is not thought of as this high-end team either. Uh, so it, maybe they'll end up being a dominant team. Uh, so we'll go, we'll look back at things and go, hey, you know, now that we knew about Blue Ridge, and Blue Ridge is in that Gunter and Bells district, uh, but they've always been significantly under get, uh, Gunter and Bells. So maybe that gap is closed a little bit. Maybe we'll find out uh, that Blue Ridge uh, is much closer to Bells than we thought, and maybe that will give a little bit more credence to the Boyd loss. But it was, for me, not a good loss. The question that I wanted answered, uh, could somebody come in and create that good running game uh, like they had last year to complement and to give Braden McIntyre a little bit of a break? And nobody could. So obviously that made Blue Ridge able to play back a little bit and just uh, feast on McIntyre 
in, in this game. And Boyd obviously is not going to have a good season if they are losing the turnover battle by four every single game. Was this a one-off? You know, we were worried about Brock last year. Was that a one-off? And it kept going and kept going and kept going. And now here we are in 2023, first game, three big turnovers for, for them. So hopefully Boyd can get a little bit more consistency and clean that up a little bit. Uh, but they did not look good against Blue Ridge. Uh, this week they're going to be taking on Jacksboro. And Jacksboro had a very, very dominant win against Breckenridge. Jacksboro had their way with the Buckaroos. They piled up almost 600 yards of offense against Breckenridge. Uh, Lando Belcher, 15 of 26 for 326 yards and five touchdowns. Uh, and then Luke Sams ran the ball nine times for 140 yards. Uh, they also had 253 total rushing yards, 326 total passing yards. And now they're going to be taking on uh, Boyd this week. Again, I think Jacksboro is going to be able to name their score uh, something like you know, 63, 56, 63 uh, to 14 to 21, depending on how Boyd is able to do uh, in the second half. I'm not very optimistic about Boyd's chances uh, this week against uh, Jacksboro. Got a chance to see Peaster uh, against Toller this past week, and uh, for a, for about 26 minutes of, of game time, Peaster had uh, Toller just running in circles at times. Uh, this game was 14 to nine in the third quarter uh, before. Toller was able to score five touchdowns in pretty much a 12-minute span. Uh, Peaster just looked like they got wore out. I think that the heat really started to impact them. The lack of depth, you know, even though Peaster is a 3A school that is growing, uh, their, their football numbers are still not great. This is still a, a program that is establishing itself and lost several players in the uh, not only to graduation, but transferring out of there. So Peaster, number-wise, Toller as a 2A Division One school had a lot more on their roster uh, than Peaster did. Uh, Ty Steedley was very efficient in his passing game, uh, 11 of 17 for 124 yards, but in that third quarter uh, and kind of the collapse at the end, he had two interceptions, which ended up really costing Peaster, uh, ran the ball 13 times for 47 yards. And again, this is a 2A, a lot of people have, I think, Toller's ranked number two uh, in 2A Division One. So obviously a team that is very, very good. And again, for 26 minutes, Peaster was right there with them. So, you know, we talk about quality losses, and 49-9 to nine might not be a quality loss, but how it happened, I, I give Peaster a little bit of the benefit of the doubt uh, with a quality loss. Uh, I, Rhett Steen was fantastic. Uh, Rhett Kelly uh, had some nice, uh, had a nice catch. Kenton Morrow had a couple of catches. Uh, I, I saw a lot, despite the fact, and I saw a lot of battle, uh, and I really liked that offensive line of Peaster. I thought they were a little bit better than I was expecting, obviously playing uh, one of the top teams in the state which warmed down in the second half. But right now, if, if, I, if somebody's asking me who I think is going to uh, get that fourth spot, at least in week two or episode three of the District 4-3A report, I'm going to give that nod to Peaster. And again, this may change because, like I said, got one, two, and three, four, five, six, seven, all fighting. And we haven't even seen Ponder yet. And Ponder is going to be taking on Dunbar this week. Uh, Dunbar lost to Wilmer Hutchins 33-7, to uh, but Dunbar is probably significantly better than Ponder, but we're going to find out. You know, uh, They had a really hard time stopping Wilmer Hutchins. Uh, the passing game, they had a sophomore come in and pretty much light him up. Uh, they were also able to get some chunk yardage. We know Ponder is able to throw the ball very well, at least uh, in the past, so we'll kind of find out how that transitions. But I think, uh, I think we're going to see Dunbar win probably by 21 points against Ponder, uh, you know, kind of a 49 to 28 game. I think Ponder will get some points, uh, but I think it won't, I don't think they're going to be able to stop Dunbar at all. Uh, and then Peaster against uh, Fort Worth Castleberry uh, to kind of double back to that Castleberry lost to uh, Mineral Wells 47 to 14 this past week. Uh, Castleberry, their passing game is pretty bad. They did not complete a pass last week, uh, 0 of 8 uh, with an interception. But the running game, uh, they have multiple runners who can uh, move the ball. Caden Perez uh, ran the ball 19 times for 122 yards. Uh, Carlos Salazar ran the ball 8 times for 43 yards. Isaiah Ford ran the ball 13 times for 50 yards. And Valadez, their quarterback, uh, did not complete a pass, but ran the ball 4 times for 43 yards. 
uh, and that was where they accounted for their two touchdowns. Uh, so if Castle, I think Castleberry will be able to, to run a little bit against Peaster, uh, but I think Peaster size-wise uh, will take advantage of Castleberry. I think Peaster bounces back uh, with a 35-21 to 21 kind of a win against uh, Castleberry. So you look at all of that, our picks this week, just to kind of recap, you've got, uh, I'm taking Paradise over Munster, uh, taking Whitesboro over Bells, I'm going to take Dunbar over Ponder, Brock over Hershey, Peaster over Castleberry, Jacksboro over Boyd, and Plainview, Oklahoma over Pilot Point. Hope I'm wrong on a couple of my uh, lower uh, my lower tier uh, games uh, because I love to see District 4-3A and I love to see them succeed. But right now it looks like you know the computer gap when I'm looking at the scores would say that Paradise Whitesboro and Brock will win all those games by 60. You know that's that's the golf I'm talking about right now, and I think those numbers are only going to be going up and the other numbers for the bottom four are going to be going down a bit. So uh, obviously not all those uh, teams are going to play to beat them by 60. Uh, you know, we might see a lot of young kids get in in the second half, which may you know impact the score margins, but that's just kind of that difference between the top three and the bottom four. But again, I think if you want to have a Hope Springs Eternal, if you're a fan of the bottom four, there's none of these four teams I can say is not going to make the playoffs. I mean, I think you can make a case for Ponder, you can make a case for Peaster, Boyd, you know, Boyd is probably thinking if we don't have five turnovers, that game against Blue Ridge is much different and our immediate audition is a much better one. Uh, Pilot Point, they're going to be saying we're young, we're, we're, we we always find a way to uh, make the playoffs, so uh, don't doubt us. Yeah, we're going to take our uh, licks early, but by the end of the year, we are who we are, and, and we're going to get in there. We're Pilot Point. And then Ponder, they have a new coach who is used to winning, and he wants to get in there. you got Peaster, who's got a new coach uh, who is also used to winning. So a lot of football to be had at the bottom half of this district, and it's going to be fun. Uh, now they may get uh, absolutely obliterated in the first round by Jim Ned. Jim Ned looks like they're back. Uh, this year, uh, they had a had a nice win, 34 to 12, uh, to get started. But you know, we'll find out uh, as as we get going. So, for all of our friends at the uh, District 43A report, our friends in Pilot Point, who did say that you know they did see a little bit of an uptick in in liking or subscribing or or commenting. So you know, it's good. We're we're incrementally getting there. So continue. Uh, to do that. Uh, my goal is to only do one right now. Uh, and of course, uh, I'm always allowed to give a, uh, a shout out and, and, and they'll put on something. And as a wrestling fans, we kind of integrate a little bit of wrestling in there. Uh, we lost uh, Terry Funk this past week and we lost Bray Wyatt, uh, Wyndham Rotunda. Uh, so if you want to be creative with your ending to our friends at Pilot Point, get us a little Terry Funk. Uh, in there and maybe uh, some of the creepy music from Bray Wyatt to uh, play us out but for everybody associated with the District 4 3 a report all the fans and all the uh, players who listen thank you for listening to yet another District 4 3 a report we'll be back next week and we'll break down what happened and we will see what is happening in the future uh, and we'll see you down the road fans we're standing by here with terry funk rick flair has said that on july the first right here on superstation tbs he'll make his announcement whether to surrender the championship or to defend the championship but i'll tell you this off the record he said he was going to take care of you one way or the other somewhere down the line my friend oh let me tell you something jim ross and you simple-minded people i had a dream last night oh yes and it was a beautiful dream i dreamed that i was on the front porch of the double cross ranch and my father who's long since gone was there in a swing swinging with me 
and up drove a long black limousine and the left front fender was knitted in and the door opened and out stepped a beautiful lady and my daddy said woman what happened to your left front fender and she says i ran over some kind of an animal on the road i don't know what it was my daddy said well what did it look like and she says well it had great big ears and it had nostrils big huge nostrils about five inches apart and it had horse teeth and it smelled real bad and my daddy said my world girl you must have ran over a jackass and i said what did it smell like she said it smelled like hairspray and cheap cologne I said, woman, you didn't run over any jackass. You ran over Ric Flair. Is he dead? She says, no, but the last time I saw him, he was running scared. Well, let me tell you something, Ric Flair. You look at me in the eye because I am looking at you. You realize that you must live not in the future, because there is none, you must live in the past. Give up that belt or else stick your neck out one more time for me. Stick it out for me, Flair, you gutless individual. I'm talking to you. That's enough. Stick it out. Stick it out. We're not going to listen anymore to this, fans. We'll be back with the Steiners in just a moment.